and I lived in Miami, Florida, which is a long way from here, and then I went to school in Texas, graduate school, and then I came to Lincoln for 50 years. And I don't know what I did that God would send me to Lincoln for 50 years. <laughs> Having been to Florida, right? And have these lovely winters that we have here. So those of you from Nigeria and other places in the world, I feel your pain. <laughs> right? Well, I want to talk tonight about hope and just give some ideas. And we're going to have some questions that you'll have at your table to help you think about hope in your own life. And so here's the first uh, thing I want to say. It, it's impossible for a person to live up to 70 days without food. Now, I've never tried that to myself, but research would say that's true. It's also possible to exist nearly 10 days without water. One can live for up to six minutes without air. Now, I don't know what kind of your shape your brain would be in after that, but you could live, maybe. But it's impossible to live without hope. Now, one of the things that you've heard of hope for, and as people were talking, was they're hoping for spring to come, right? And I can just say, living here for 50 years, it would have been impossible for me to live here if I didn't hope for spring and summer and fall. We have all four seasons here, and uh, some of them are good. I won't mention which ones. <laughs> I think you know. But you, you really have to make peace with the cold weather and just say, I'm going to find a way to enjoy this. And so uh, I'm still working on that 50 years later, right? And uh, so a novelist, a Russian novelist named Fyodor Dis... Oh, no, I'm going to give you a definition of hope. Hope is an optimistic state of mind, like spring is coming, that is based on an expectation of positive outcomes with respect to events and circumstances in one's life or the world at large. Now, those of you guys that have come to study here from different places in the world, you came here with hope. Now, I don't know if you hope to go home and make your, your country a better place, or maybe you hope to stay here. I know a lot of international students, they come and they, they taste America and they get to know it and they're going like, oh, I don't know if I want to go home. But likely, all of you would hope to go home, to be embraced by your family and your friends, to eat the foods that you're used to, to hear a language that you can actually understand and speak. That th those are the hopes that we carry in us. And so it's a positive outcome. It's looking to something that I really desire. Now, let me get to the Russian novelist. Dostoevsky said, to live without hope is to cease to live. You know, they have found that people that are incarcerated or taken captive, that if they don't have hope, that often they don't live. And he was speaking in a novel about this. But I think there's some real truth to that, that we need hope in order to live. And hope is the fuel that powers our souls, inspires our minds, invigorates our hearts, and motivates us to act. That's usually why we get out of bed. Now, some of you get out of bed to take a test, right? And I, you hope you studied enough to pass the test. But a lot of times, what causes us to want to act is something, not that has some reward out here, like you pass the test or you fail the test, but we're motivated to act on something that's bigger than just a test. And that's the kind of hope we need. We need to have a kind of hope that carries us, whether we are in class, at work, at home, there needs to be something in us that, caught, that motivates us, that causes us to really want to live and act well. Hope carries us through the toughest moments. 
Oh man, I, having worked with college students for 50 years, I now have alumni that call me regularly. That I had a, a young man who called me Saturday morning and I had not talked to him in decades. And he said, I just wanted to call you and tell you, my wife left me. Hmm. We've been married 41 years. Hmm. And she won't tell me why she left. And uh, part of the deal in talking to him, he, he's kind of a clueless kind of person. I think she gave plenty of clues. Hmm. And he said, I want my family back. And my hope is in the fact that God loves me and loves her. And he wants to bring us together. And I, I said to him, well, Bill, have you thought of maybe harming yourself or taking your life? Because he is very low. And he said, the only reason I have it is that I hold on to hope. And in, in the darkest times, friends, and they're coming into all of our lives, whether it's through a, a relationship problem, through death. I, I know so many people that have lost children. I've known people that have been killed in car accidents and leave a whole family. And, and what we ha need to hold on to, we need to have some kind of hope to hold on to, to get us through the difficulties of life. And I, I know you know what I'm talking about. Hope gives us the energy to fight and do something useful with our lives. Life just doesn't come easy for anybody. It's a fight. And uh, it's hard to have a life that, that really counts and you're doing something rather than you're just existing. And hope moves you from just mere existing to where you're really counting. And hope helps us live life and live it more abundantly. We just don't want to consume air and food and just call that life. We want something more than life. We want some kind of abundant life. Well, I'm a Christian, and so when I think about telling you about my hope, it comes back to that. And I want to, to tell you what Jesus said. This is one of Jesus' quotes. This really struck me when I was a college student, because that's when I made my commitment to really follow Christ. He said, I've come that they might have life and have it to the full. Jesus came not to make our life bad, <laughs> but to make our life good. Some people think that being a Christian means that you have all these things you can't do. And I think I used to think that way. But once I came to know Christ personally, I realized that he came to give me a life that was full. And, um, yeah, I mean, I'm 75 years old. And, and I just tell you, I'm just so blessed to have come to know Jesus when I was sitting where you are as a college student and to have followed him my whole life because it's so full. And it's not, not just full because I have children and I have grandchildren and I'm gonna have a great grandchild, praise the Lord. But, but I'm not, my life isn't full just because of that. It's because of what Jesus Christ has done in me. And I'll tell you about that in a minute. So, but I wanna answer this question first. What gives Christians hope? And it's Easter. Let me explain that. I think we all know about Ramadan, that now is a, a period of time that uh, people who are Muslims fast from sunrise to sunset for a number of weeks, and they're seeking and praying, and they have their religious practices. Well, Christians celebrate Easter. And the Friday before Easter, is when Jesus Christ was crucified. And so that's called Good Friday. And you go, good? Jesus was crucified? It's a good Friday? Well, I would just say it was good for 
us and bad for him. And I'll explain that in a minute. But Good Friday, so, so churches here in town, some of them on Friday night or sometime during the day on Friday, will have a service where they're gathered together and they will think about what, what happened to Jesus on the cross and his death. And then three days after his death, Christians believe that Jesus rose from the dead and he's alive today. And so if you have an opportunity to go to a church on Easter Sunday, you'll find that it's a time of celebration and joy because our hope is that Jesus is alive today and that when we die because of what he did on the cross, that we will live forever. And that's a hope. Now, here's what uh, here's what we're hoping in. That Jesus the Messiah, the Savior, died for the sins of people and rose from the dead. That he wasn't just a good man who died, but he was a God man who died. That he took on himself at that cross everything you and I have ever done wrong and everything everybody who lived before us has done wrong and everything that everyone lives on the other side of us has done wrong and he could do that because he was God and God wanted a relationship with us he wanted us to be his children his adopted children and so Easter is a time of celebration and it's really our ultimate hope. It's celebrated globally. My wife was in India in 1986 with a small team from Lincoln, and they were there during Easter. And in India, in Bangalore, uh, she was a part of a Christian group. And on Easter Sunday, they celebrated, and they had, they had worship services, and they baptized people, and it was a time of joy. So globally, Christians all around the world for the last 2,000 years have said Easter is where we look for hope, that he is not dead, he is alive. Was a college kid, I, I had a Christian background, I was raised in a Christian family, went to a Christian church, but when I got to college, I one of my majors was philosophy. And I began to hear and think things that I'd never heard before. And I began to think, well, all of this Jesus stuff, all of this death and resurrection stuff, is that just wishful thinking? Is that just something that we uh, take to soothe our souls and make life better for us, that we're kind of wishing that life would continue, and that we're just not animals, that when we die, we die, and nothing more is said. And I began to have these thoughts. I wondered, was it just superstition? If I had born, been born in India, like some of you, would I even be open to this idea? Or would I just kind of put Jesus as one of the possible gods over here that may be kind of a good luck, to uh, do something with Jesus. Or if I was a Buddhist, would I think, well, Jesus is kind of a second-rate Buddha. What would have I thought if I was raised in another country, in another culture? And so I concluded that before I would totally walk away from following Jesus, I need to see what he actually said and what he actually did. And that's when I began to read the Bible. I began to read the first books of the New Testament called the Gospels that talk about the life of Jesus. And because of that and because of some people that God brought into my life who began to talk to me about their relationship with Jesus, I began to have a conviction that maybe there really is something to this. That the religion, there is, 
that the faith of Christians is based on reality and not on wishful thinking because the historical record of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus is pretty solid. And it's not just wishful thinking or superstition. So I made a commitment as a sophomore at the University of Oklahoma that I would believe that Jesus Christ died for me, that he arose from the dead, and that I would give my life to following him. You know what? I've never looked back. I've never been sorry that I did that because I was freed from guilt of the sin that I committed. I was given a new power on the inside and a, a joy and a peace that I really hadn't known before. And I still carry that in me today. Even in the most difficult of circumstances, that I, when I look deeply, I find the presence and love of Jesus. That was 56 years ago. And I want to just go give two verses, and I want to give you some things to talk about at your table. In 1 Timothy chapter 2, beginning in verse 3, this is the Bible. It says, This is good and pleases God our Savior, who wants all people to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. So one thing I know for sure tonight is God wants everyone to be saved and to come to know the truth. And then what's the truth? There is one God and one mediator between God and mankind, the man, Jesus Christ, Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all people. That's the truth. And that's, that's how we're saved, is by trusting in Jesus. And then one other verse. Because this verse really would have fit me before I made a commitment to Christ. And it's uh, first, oh, not Mark, 1 Corinthians 1.18. It says, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. There was a time that this whole story was foolishness to me when I was in college, but you know what? I was perishing. I had no hope. But now, for the last 56 years, as I have followed him, that this word this truth of the cross has saved me because it is the power of God. So there are three questions that you can talk about around your table. And the first one is, what is your level of hope? If you were going to say around the table, well, my level of hope, my expectation, my hope today, maybe it's half, half, half full Maybe it's a quarter full. Maybe it's just a quarter empty. But kind of give a gauge of here's where my hope is today. The second question is what is your hope based on? And why do you have hope or do you have hope? See, there may be some folks here today that say, well, I really don't have any hope. And you know, that's okay. I was there. It's okay to be there. Or you might say, I'm hoping uh, because I'm smart and I've got these scholarships and life's going to work out for me. Well, that's okay if that's what your hope is. Just to, I think it helps to just be able to say, this is what I'm hoping in. And then a third question is, what do you think about the hope of Christians? What do you think about the hope that I told you about? You might think, he is a sick man. Well, that'd be okay. That's fine. It's not going to insult me. I'll probably say, if you only knew how sick I am. <laughs> and, uh, but to be honest, what do you think about the hope of Christians? So let's take a few minutes around the table and uh, kick off these questions. And I think Josh is coming here with some instructions. Thank you so much, Brett. Let's give him a round of applause. Uh, if you'd like to 
at your table to start discussing these questions. We'll have about 10 or 15 minutes. Uh, whether you agree, disagree. Again, what is your level of hope? What is your hope based on? Why do you have hope or not have hope? And what do you think about the hope of Christians? We'll reconvene here in about 10 or 15 minutes.